Okay, I want you to just let a number sink in for a second. 16 billion. Mm. 16 billion. I mean, that's not just a big number, right? It's actually the confirmed largest password leak oh. ever in history. Yeah. And it represents this huge um, release of like weaponizable intelligence. It's staggering. And what's really critical here, I think, is that this deep dive, it's all about understanding what this actually means, the mm -hmm. implications. Right. Our mission, really, is to unpack what this unprecedented amount of data means for your digital life. Mm. And, you know, crucially, to give you some clear, actionable steps, things you can do right now to uh, protect yourself better. Exactly. And to do that, we're digging into some pretty comprehensive reports, analyses from cybersecurity experts, yeah. plus tech sources you probably know, like Forbes, Tom's Hardware, Apple Insider, Cointelegraph too. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to put this whole thing in the bigger picture of cyber attacks generally, because let's face it, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. No, it definitely doesn't. And let's really try and grasp the scale here. 16 billion logging credentials. That includes passwords. Exposed. It's almost hard to believe. It really is. Yeah. I mean, put it this way. That's roughly two accounts for every single person alive on the planet. Wow. Two accounts for everybody. Okay, that really lands the scale. But hang on. Here's the bit that got my attention. Almost all of this data is new. That's the key point. It's not just, you know, old breaches getting recycled, stuff we maybe already knew about. Apparently only one chunk, like 184 million records, had been seen before. Exactly. So this is fresh intelligence, weaponizable intelligence. Yeah. And at a scale we just haven't seen before. So how did they find this? I mean, 30 different data sets? Yeah. The investigation, it kicked off earlier this year, and they uncovered 30 distinct sets of data. And the sizes, they're all over the place. Some are tens of millions. One was over three and a half billion records. Three and a half billion in one go. Yeah. And they saw, for instance, a huge batch from Portuguese speaking areas, a lot of Russian logins, and even specifically 60 million records tied to Telegram accounts. Telegram. Okay. Yeah. And what's actually in these records? Is it just emails or? Well, typically sources say it includes a URL, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the website the login details like a username or email, right. and the password itself. So basically everything a hacker needs. Pretty much. It opens the door to, well, almost any online service you can think of. Your Apple account, Facebook, Google, but also things like GitHub for developers, Telegram, like we said, even government services. It's incredibly widespread then, not targeted. Not at all. Which leads to the question, okay, how did this even happen? How does this much data leak? Yeah. What's the theory? Researchers think it's likely the combined work of lots of different info stealers. Info stealers, like malware. Exactly, types of malware. They get onto individual devices, maybe websites, and they scrape this data. And then, often, the data gets exposed through, like, unsecured cloud storage. Ah, okay. So things like um, databases left open online, Elasticsearch or something. Precisely. Elasticsearch, maybe some misconfigured file storage buckets. They get left exposed, maybe accidentally, and boom, it's an open door for attackers. It really shows how, you know, the human side of setting up the cloud is just as critical as the tech security itself. Okay, so that's the scale. That's how it might have happened. Let's bring it back. What does this mean for you listening right now? This isn't some abstract news story. No, it absolutely isn't. It has direct personal impact. And look, password compromise, it's no joke. It leads directly to account compromise, account takeover. Which can mess up pretty much everything important in your life given how much we rely on tech. Totally. Okay. This kind of leaked data, it's basically ground zero for targeted phishing attacks, for quick account takeovers. The attackers have the keys. And I saw mentions, particularly for crypto holders, they're even more vulnerable. Yeah, there's definitely an elevated risk there. Think about targeted attempts to take over custodial wallets or platforms tied to your email access. If they get your email password from this leak. Right, they can reset everything. Exactly. And there's also the danger, maybe less obvious, to seed phrase backups. If someone <laughs> stupidly uh, stored their seed phrase backup based on a password in a cloud service that gets compromised. Yeah. Well, attackers could potentially get direct access to the private keys. Ouch. Okay. And there's this other angle too, this unseen danger. We don't actually know how many unique people are affected, right? Because the data overlaps. That's true. It's hard to tell the exact number of individuals. But maybe even more critical is that these newly leaked credentials, they might not be in the public checkers yet. Like, have I been plowed or the ones built into Firefox or Chrome? Right. 
Those services are great, but they need time to get and process the data. So you might not get a notification that your data is out there from this specific leak. Which means you can't wait. You have to be proactive. Absolutely vital. You just cannot wait to be told. No. The time to act is, well, right now. Okay. So that takes us straight into what do we do? Your digital armor, the practical steps. Yeah, and the basic idea here, the foundation, is that cybersecurity isn't just a tech problem, it's a shared responsibility. Companies need to do their part, absolutely, but individuals have to be vigilant too, proactive. So bottom line for listeners, mm -hmm. what are the immediate actions? What should people do today? Okay, number one, change your passwords especially for critical accounts. Number two, start using a password manager, seriously commit to it. And number three, switch to passkeys wherever you can. Now's the moment to really tackle your digital security. Let's unpack those password managers. You called it a lifeline. Why is it so crucial beyond just convenience? Oh, it's way more than convenience. It's a core security tool. It generates unique, really strong passwords for every site. You mm -hmm. know, random characters, long. Impossible to remember. Exactly. One expert we saw mentioned use 429 unique randomly generated passwords. You can't do that manually. 429. Wow. I think most of us before managers were probably using like pet's name plus birthday plus exclamation mark. Maybe. Agrees. Something like that. And the manager doesn't just create them. It warns you if you've accidentally reused a password somewhere else. That's huge. And it can often link you straight to the website's change password page. Makes it much easier. So what stops people? Is it the setup? There are good options now, right? Apple has one built in. There's one password, Dashlane. Yeah, there are great options, free and paid. And honestly, the setup is usually pretty smooth. Plus, biometrics like Face ID or Touch ID on your phone or computer, they secure the manager itself. Ah, so you don't even need to know the super complex passwords. Correct. You unlock the manager with your face or fingerprint, and it fills in the crazy password for you. It okay. takes away that whole, I need to remember this burden. Okay, so password manager, essential. What's next? You mentioned MFA. Multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. MFA, or sometimes yeah. called 2FA, two-factor authentication. This is non-negotiable. Set it up for every account that offers it, period. And there are different types, right? Like SMS codes versus apps. Yeah. Code generator apps especially the ones built into some password managers now, or standalone apps like Google Authenticator or Authy, they're generally better than SMS texts. Because of SIM swapping. Exactly. SIM swapping is a real risk, where hackers trick your phone company into moving your number to their phone so they get your SMS codes. But look, if SMS is the only option an account offers, it's still way better than nothing. Use it. Okay. And then you mentioned passkeys. That sounds newer. It is, and it's kind of the future direction. <laughs> Passkeys basically get rid of the username and password altogether. Really? They rely on a hardware device, usually your phone or computer, which is protected by vital metrics like your fingerprint or face. Mm -hmm. When you log in, the device proves it's you cryptographically without sending a password. It's much more secure and resistant to phishing. Interesting. So that's becoming more common. Increasingly, yeah. Major platforms are rolling it out. And for people who need, like, Extreme security, think political figures, journalists, activists, anyone expecting targeted attacks. they are also physical security keys. Like little USB drives. Yeah, exactly. You plug it in or tap it to authenticate. Uh -huh. That provides probably the strongest level of protection against remote attacks. Got it. Okay, beyond passwords and MFA, what about just good habits online? Absolutely crucial. Cultivating smart digital habits is huge. For example, Apple's Hide My Email feature. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. It creates unique, random email addresses for different services that forward to your real inbox. This stops spam, but it also makes it much harder for hackers to link your accounts together if one service gets breached because they don't have your real email. Clever. And the big one, phishing. Oh, absolutely. Vigilance against phishing is paramount. Rule one, never, ever open links or attachments from unknown numbers or emails. Just don't. Even if it looks legit, like mm -hmm. from your bank. Especially then, if you get an email or text that seems like it's from your bank or PayPal or whatever, and it asks you to click a link to log in or verify something, don't click the link. So what do you do? Open your web browser separately, type in the bank's official website, address yourself, log in there manually, and check for any messages or alerts. Nine times out of ten, that suspicious email was fake. That one simple habit could save so much trouble. Huge amounts. Yeah. And it's good to see operating systems helping a bit too. Like I think the latest iOS 
iOS 26, apparently automatically moves calls and texts from unknown numbers into a separate section. Makes it a bit easier to just ignore potential scams. Okay, that's helpful. What about the companies? What's their responsibility in all this? Big responsibility. Organizations really need to embrace things like zero trust security models. Zero trust, mm -hmm. meaning? Meaning you don't automatically trust anyone or anything inside your network either. You constantly verify. Every user, every device, every application trying to access resources needs to be authenticated and authorized every time. It's not just about building a strong wall around the outside. Right. Assume breaches can happen. Exactly. And use strong privileged access controls. Limit who can access sensitive systems. Make sure it's always authenticated, authorized, and importantly, logged. It's about limiting the potential damage, the blast radius, if something does go wrong. This whole incident, it really throws the spotlight on the broader world of cyber attacks, doesn't it? It really does. So just to be clear, when we say cyber attack, what are we actually talking about? Fundamentally, is any attempt using computers or digital systems to do harm. That could be stealing information, like in this password leak. It could be altering data, exposing private stuff, disabling systems like in ransomware attacks, destroying information, or just breaching systems and networks. And why are we still so vulnerable? It feels like we hear about these things constantly. Well, a big part is our sheer dependence on technology now. Everything's connected. Systems are incredibly complex. I think complexity means bugs. Always. Virtually all software and hardware has bugs vulnerabilities that could potentially be exploited. And here's a slightly uncomfortable fact. Software makers generally aren't legally liable for the costs if a vulnerability in their product gets exploited. Really? So there's not a huge financial incentive for them to make it perfect? Well, reputation matters, but legally, the liability often isn't there in the same way as with, say, a physical product defect. It's a tricky area. Okay. And how do these attacks actually work? Is there a typical process? Often, yes. Security folks sometimes talk about the cyber kill chain, a sort of model for how attacks unfold. It usually starts with reconnaissance. Spying, basically. Yeah, attackers gather information about their target, who works there, what systems they use, looking for weaknesses. Then comes weaponization. Building the bomb. Kind of. Building the exploit, packaging the malware designed to take advantage of a specific vulnerability they found. Then delivery. Getting it to the target. Phishing emails. That's the most common way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Phishing emails with malicious links or attachments. Could also be drive-by downloads from visiting a hacked website, or sometimes insiders are involved, or even attacks coming through a compromised supplier. Okay, so it gets delivered. Then what? Exploitation. Okay. The malware runs, it exploits the vulnerability. Often it tries to create a backdoor, gain more privileges like administrator rights on the system. So it can stick around. Exactly. They want persistence, they want to evade detection, and ultimately often they want to exfiltrate data, steal information, or maybe deploy ransomware. And who's actually doing this? Is it still the stereotype of the lone hacker in a hoodie? Sometimes, maybe for smaller stuff. But the major threats? No way. Most significant cyber attacks today are carried out by organized teams, highly skilled, well-resourced experts. Like criminal gangs. Organized crime groups, definitely. They're very sophisticated now. And also state-sponsored hackers working for national intelligence agencies or militaries. And yeah, insiders can be a factor too, sometimes accidentally, through mistakes, but sometimes deliberately. And why? What are they after? Money. Money is a huge driver, absolutely. Selling stolen data like these passwords on the dark web, ransomware demands, direct financial theft. But it's not the only motive. What else? Espionage, stealing government or corporate secrets. Hacktivism, which is hacking for political or social causes, maybe defacing websites or leaking documents. And there's this whole growing industry now. Cybercrime is a service. Wait, you can rent a hacker? Pretty much. You can buy or rent pre-made exploits, access to botnets networks of already infected computers, even ransomware kits. Wow. So you don't even need to be that technical yourself. Exactly. It lowers the barrier to entry dramatically. Someone with bad intentions, but maybe not top-tier hacking skills, can still launch pretty sophisticated attacks by buying the tools and services. It makes the problem much wider. And the damage. It's not just about losing your password, is it? The consequences go way beyond that. Oh, far beyond. We're talking huge financial losses for companies and individuals, identity theft, which can ruin someone's life for years, mm -hmm. destruction of critical data or systems, real psychological harm for victims, 
and massive reputational damage for organizations that get breached. It touches everything. So let's circle back then. We started with this massive number, 16 billion. It sounds terrifying and it is serious. It is serious, definitely. Yeah. But the key thing to take away, I hope, is that you're not helpless. You have powerful tools, effective habits you can put in place. Right. This deep dive, hopefully it's armed you with the knowledge and crucially those immediate steps you can take to really get on top of your password security starting right now. Absolutely. So maybe here's a final thought for everyone listening to Mullover. In this world where these cyber threats feel constant, what's the single most impactful shift you can make in your own digital habits? Not just for one account, but for your whole online life to give yourself that bit more peace of mind, something to think about. Stay safe out there.